once we see that light up. Okay, welcome everybody to the November 2021 Microsoft 365 Modern Management Meetup. My name is Mark O'Shea, and I'll be kind of leading leading the conversations uh, today. And our two our two normal co co hosts, Steve and Ben, are uh, both on the same flight on the way over, or multiple flights on the way to Amsterdam. Now, I guess this kind of violates you know those you know organisations that have got policies about not letting two important people be on the same flight at the same time. Um, this is this is violating that for me. Um, so it's yeah, but you know, the, there's something happening over in Amsterdam that I think Steve needs to go to for work. And I think Ben is going over for fun because he needs fun, a holiday. Needs and our, our borders are finally <laughs> opened up again. Um, so yeah, so with that, uh, they won't be uh, they won't be on. But uh, we kind of planned out this topic in advance. And if you were on the last month's call, uh, you probably you know you may have noticed them both being um, yeah being very uh, adamant adamant about the fact that they weren't going to be responsible for talking about the the main topic for today. Uh, so it, so no no problem it hasn't left me in the lurch. I was I was expecting to have to run most of this one anyway. So. I guess just a, a few things here. First of all, just like you know, normal, you know, pretty similar agenda to what we normally have. Like, if there's anyone new who just wants to do a a quick introduction, whether you want to just unmute to introduce yourself or drop comments into chat, um, you know, we'll uh, we'll have an opportunity to do that. We've got a few a few decisions to talk about around some of the the upcoming meetings. And I guess having a smaller number of people attending means that um, your input is going to be very important. So, you know, so basically, you know, we need to figure out, you know, we've got December's content already planned, but we haven't published anything yet for H1. Uh, so, uh, so think about some of the things that you want and we'll talk about it. And then in the Ignite 2021 stuff, I, I Sophie, welcome. Yeah, I'll, I've got to get used to, to crayon. Um, what was um, it took me forever to get used to what ripe were before they became ripe, um, but that's good. Now I've completely forgotten it, so that's that's fantastic. Um, but for the ignite twenty uh, twenty one announcements or H two, um, yeah, obviously we're not going to go through everything. Instead, it's just a few things that I've that I picked out that you know at least for me are things that are going to be somewhat uh, somewhat interesting. Uh, but if there are other things that you saw that I completely missed, uh, because I was doing weird hours last week, so I actually wasn't able to join any any live sessions apart from one that I was scheduled to to be on. So, uh, so yeah, we can talk a little bit more about that as we go through. And then as we get into the final section, um, the you know, building you know, building a sentinel environment, the thing that I want to do here that's just a little bit different for the uh, versus what you might normally see when it comes to Sentinel is a lot of the time the Sentinel conversations assume that you've got Azure credit or that someone is paying your bills and they're telling you, you know, connect these data sources and those data sources, spin up these VMs and as you're, you know, start bringing all your logs in. Now that's well and good for some of us, but in other cases, there are people who maybe aren't ready to sort of do some kind of financial commitment. Maybe they don't really you know, that, or they don't have any access to any of the, you know, the, uh, you know, the types of subscriptions that, you know, some of you or, you know, I, I won't, I won't assume most of you. I'll assume some of you because assuming that people have got some Azure subscription they've got easy access to, is not a mistake I will make again. I've made it way too many times. So what I'll do here as we go through that section is really just give you a bit of an idea of some of the things you can you can do to you know, build an environment that's not going to keep keep you or cost you all that uh, that much. Um, so, so, so what I'd like it to end up being is Sentinel for cents per you know for cents a day kind of thing. Uh, so, because there are a lot of you know free data sources, but obviously you still will need an Azure subscription um, underneath that. So we'll spend a bit of time so a uh, bit of time going through that. So I guess just. Um, I saw that. Yeah, Sophie. Sophie did a quick intro. So, Sophie, what other technologies that 
in your role, I'll, I'll say RIPE until I'm forced to, and if, as soon as I stop receiving emails from RIPE and I'm receiving emails from Crayon, I guess that still makes it okay for me to, to say to say RIPE. Um, but I'm just curious, so what are the, the technology focus areas that you've got? Yeah, hi everybody. Yeah, RIPE is fine. I mean, we still associate with RIPE until, you know, um, probably next year will be a hard changeover. But up till then, yeah, just run with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, so my role within RIPE is a business success manager, um, which is more of a, a coaching role. I work for the um, productivity team under Adam Smith. I don't know if you know Adam Smith. He used to, you know, um, work in a large MPS. Um, and so predominantly it's, yeah, my, my focus is productivity, which is the hero skew of business premium um, and the okay. new vendor that's coming out that's going to plug in with that, um, E3, E5, E um, and a little bit of the security as well. So we actually get to talk about Microsoft 365 business premium a couple of times in in the Ignite section, so so well well timed. Um, now, I guess just for those of you who maybe work in customer environments or not not based in regions where Ripe uh, uh, has a has a strong presence, uh, Ripe is one of uh, well not just Microsoft, but effectively like a licensing partner that uh, like if I guess for most people the the awareness that they probably have through Ripe if they're in the Microsoft world is you know, traditionally would have been through like things like volume license agreements, uh, but now would primarily be through uh, through CSP, so the cloud solution provider. Uh, so basically, you know, the, uh, you know, so basically that that model for your sub sub EA scope uh, customers, and I guess I shouldn't say EA, I should say enterprise agreement. So, so basically, you know, targeting, uh, you know, mid, you know, small to mid mid sized organizations in terms of my uh, Microsoft licensing, including their their cloud solutions, uh, as well as a ton of other you know plenty of other vendors. It's it is definitely not just Microsoft. No, we've um, got, um, I'm still well. I'm relatively new, so I only joined at the start of September. So <laughs> I've only just wrapped myself around the productivity products. But you know, there's also DocuSign and and Veeam, and you know a whole. A whole you know stack of other vendors yeah. um you know intune and avport and so forth okay and i'm glad someone just popped into here because i was about to ask you based on you working for ripe was it phil mayer who told you you should come along to this uh no no oh. i i've been in meetups um i've been in the meetup you know community for a long time i used to work in the federal government st space in the tech sector and that's where i started you know um, creating meetups for as my user groups, but I um it's just part of my own learning. Um, I wanted to you know wrap my head around all this stuff as quickly as possible because I'm I coach partners, I help them grow and um and sort of help them sort of upgrade, but also bring on new SKUs and so forth. So um yeah, it's just self um yeah just self learning. Okay, so so I can see. So now, yes, I was about to say, you know, because normally Phil pushes people along to this, and no doubt, if you haven't already had interactions with your with Phil in your role, I'm pretty sure that you will. And yeah, I'm glad sure. you said I'm glad you said that he it wasn't him because otherwise he'd be trying to collect an attendee bounty from me, and <laughs> nobody nobody wants to know the price I have to pay when someone says Phil sent me. <laughs> Yeah, no, I um, no, I've, I've been in partner meetings all day today. So, okay, so, so let's <laughs> now I'm waiting to see what what Phil's. Okay, okay, Phil, I will I will send you the usual payment, but just don't tell anyone what it is. <laughs> okay, so so just moving on to the um. Uh, to the upcoming meeting. So next month we'll be going through and just sort of doing endpoint manager year in uh, year in review. Now I guess the you know just to put this into perspective is like when we first started like this meetup, um, you know, when we first started this one off, really it was quite a heavy focus and it was mostly you know different you know different Intune uh, slash endpoint manager topics over you know that we were going through 
uh, initially. But you know, as you know, as we sort of covered a lot of the basics and have you know made sure that we start including other things, we probably need to make sure that we do actually, you know, uh, at least like once a quarter, make sure that we are going back and sort of just you know revisiting the initial purpose as to why we you know why we established this uh, this group, um, but. Uh, moving into January, some of the things that we that we need to think about here is, first of all, if we do, it looks like we will have the ability to start accessing some of the facilities that uh, haven't been available to us for a while. So any of you who are like, in Sydney, that means that we, you know, potentially we will be having uh, in-person events provided nothing goes horribly wrong with with lockdowns and things like that. Uh, now the, I guess the thing that we want to make sure though is, is because we, you know, we know that we've got quite a few people who join regularly uh, from other countries, other states, etc. Uh, yeah, we want to make sure that we can, like, get get an environment that works for us to, you know, to have people in a room as well as having people remotely. Now the the reason why I'm saying that one is that, uh, you know, if, if someone normally suggests to me, you know. You know, could you sort of do it in person, but we'll have remote people join? Um, normally, that makes me a little bit uncomfortable for a few different reasons. But yeah, sometimes the the venue layout just isn't right for it, and the people who are remote sometimes are just you know feeling quite disconnected because there's always something going on in the room that they're they're missing. They're not necessarily hearing the side conversations, etc. So, uh, so if we can figure out. Um, you know whether we're doing it at uh, at Microsoft's office over in North Sydney uh, now that it's opened up again, or potentially when uh, when uh, Reactor above Wynyard opens up again. But we'll just wait and see uh, until I wait for Steve to come back uh, because, like, I guess Steve's probably going to be the deciding factor because he he doesn't live too far from there, so he's probably the person who is going to be most likely. Now, other things that we, you know, that are going to be things we need to consider for whether we can use venues will be like, what's the, you know, what what's the after hours access policy? Can people get in and out of the building uh, to that particular meeting room without having, you know, security badge access? So there's, because we can't really just have someone stationed outside the building for the entire evening. Uh, so we'll we'll figure those things out and just see see how it all goes and actually make sure that we've we've also got approval. So Jerome. Um, have you organized to meet up with Ben or Steve over the next few days? Because they are heading to Amsterdam. Yeah, I know. Good morning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting in a car driving to a customer, so I can't see any video, whatever. Oh, OK. Uh, <laughs> now, um, uh, the, the planning is to meet Steve and Ben in uh, Utrecht uh, next Friday, so... No, oh, okay. So, yeah, so it's exciting. Yeah, like Australians yeah. can go places again. Yeah, it's freaking cold over here, so... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, so, but uh, I, I, I hope that they uh, will make it uh, today. <laughs> they will find yeah. today, I think. So, so yeah, it's uh, exciting well, think uh, yes, someone they... post <laughs> yeah, like their plane leaves in like three and a half hours or or something like that. So um, I'm sure we'll get some updates from them before uh, before they take off, especially if their flight is delayed or cancelled. But we don't we do not wish that on them at all. Okay, uh, so now so they, they are leaving today from yeah. Australia. And then, yeah. Ah, yeah. yeah, I thought they were going to land today in the, in the Netherlands. So. Uh, no, so they'll yeah, so they'll leave. So they'll be in Netherlands in a day, no, over over twenty four hours. I'm pretty sure of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I I can remember from my trip in to Australia in 2019 that we left at 1 a.m. in from Brisbane, and we arrived here in Netherlands the same day, around was it uh, half past seven in the evening or something like that. So it is possible that they leave. Oh, on, yeah, yeah. They arrive on Thursday again. <laughs> of on Wednesday, sorry. OK, then. So so I guess now just the things to just sort of to drop it into the chat or just to to think about it and reach out 
if there's any kind of burning topics that you you think we should be uh, we should be covering. Now I think we've mostly gone through the things that we wanted to cover, or you know, last time we sort of sort of put the feelers out and had everyone start making suggestions. Uh, we pretty much went through most of that stuff. There were a few things that we didn't really get to that might be something that will make sense, and you'll see that you know effectively this is something that will make sense once we start getting into uh, into some of the announcements. There's something that does tie in well to that. But if there's anything in particular that you want, so Phil, I've I've already got that one <laughs> that one lined up for you. Um, so that we, we can talk about that one a little bit in, in here. And I've been checking my tenant uh, daily to see if it's lighting up in there yet, but it not not yet. Um, so yeah, so I guess then like those of you who, who are Sydney based as well, uh, let me know if it's something where you would be potentially interested in doing in-person events. Uh, let's not commit to December because Steve, <laughs> Steve's not around for that one, or Steve's not around now and I don't want to commit on his behalf. And I don't want to throw Phil or, or Hock under the bus um, for this one, but uh, but maybe from January we'll wait and see and see how it goes. Okay, so who have we got? So yeah, so even yeah, so some of the lighthouse stuff that started looks like it's starting to shape up a bit um, as well. And yeah, and yeah, and as I mentioned, you know, those you know, those of you who aren't in Sydney, no, we're not going to start blocking you because you can't do it, yeah, you know, because you can't attend. Uh, we, you know, we want to make sure that we've got, you know, a bit more, a bit more diversity than just, you know, people who can make it into the North Sydney office, which is going to, you know, quite or even the Sydney reactor office. Okay, so. So I'm just taking a look at the at the comments that are, are coming in. Yes, yeah, so, so Eddie, yeah, it's a. I guess the border's open again, isn't it? With quickly, so you could you could drive drive down. I can't can't get there yet. Um, we can uh, if we go south. I don't think we can come back till 17th oh, of December. Yeah. Okay. You don't want to. You don't. Or maybe you do want to do that. You never. You never know. Well, when the guy said they were travelling to. Netherlands, I thought they were having a G up. Oh no, the, yeah. So it's um, yeah, it's just so weird now hearing people talking about about travel again after, you know, we're getting close to two years now, um, of of no travel. Oh yeah, so yeah, so um, so Robert, yeah, so we'll definitely do yeah have like let's call it a hybrid a hybrid event, um. <laughs> Yeah, moving at some point moving forward. And it's just a matter of trying to make sure that we can reserve a room that suit, you know, that that suits the task uh, properly. So uh, as opposed to it just being a meeting room and yeah, being and relying on somebody's laptop being what's driving teams. I think we've got some slightly better solutions available to us now than what we had, um, you know, going back to I think March last year was the last in-person one we held. And things like things like you know enhancements with the team's room devices, etc., uh, should you know, effectively like Phil. You can correct and crop. Actually, I'm assuming either of you have been into the office in North Sydney, but I'm assuming that they're all fitted out with new devices, new AV equipment, etc., like that. So, oh yeah, it's yeah. very slick in there. But we're not allowed in there until December 15, mate. Yeah, which is, yeah, which is why the December <laughs> time frame, yeah, the December meetup will be before that, because that is definitely after the second second Wednesday. Yep. OK, so with that, let's jump into, like, as I said, some of the Ignite announcements. Now, I've, I've just cherry picked some of the ones that I think are things that I'll probably need to know something about at some point fairly soon. Um, now, obviously, there's a, a ton of different things in here. Now, I've even included a few things that I'm not particularly interested in, but I know that people get excited about some of this, these things. And that's actually the first bullet point underneath the Azure Virtual Desktop announcement, which is uh, that that you'll have AVD support for your, I think that probably the big thing there, I think it's the, and anyone correct me if I'm wrong, it's the, it's the Windows multi-session stuff that I guess is really the, the big one. Um, 
so yeah, so I guess this is one of the you know, the questions that you'd always see when uh, when Win Ten uh, multi session edition was released. Uh, a lot of people, you know, not reading the announcement where it said it will initially be available on Azure with other platforms potentially coming, and the first comments you'd always see in chat would be. Why isn't it supported in whatever environment they they had? It's kind of you know the, the good old game of predict what the predict predict what the comments are going to be in chat, and I think we all get pretty good at these things by now. So this is so this one is obviously important for orgs that want to keep this stuff um, on prem, but still want uh, some of those uh, some of those capabilities. So uh, so that's one that for me like Azure Stack is something that I don't think I'll ever have to really deal with, or I, I guess in this case, as you stack HCI, I, I don't really think that's something that, I, it's not that I would actively seek to do anything with it, um, but it's, yeah, I don't really want to get back into, into the world of effectively on-prem servers again, which is, I know as you stack is more than that, but the on-prem element of it is enough for me to go, Oh no, no, not not for me. Um, now I know that's an overly simple explanation of Azure Stack, but um, you know. So so now the other one that, and this is one that was kind of like a bit of a a weird initial, um, you know, piece that wasn't in AVD, which was that you had, um, you know, you didn't have the ability for your uh, auto scale uh, rules in there to have things like you to say, look, I specifically want to start and stop VMs at particular times based on, I know this is when, you know, employees are going to start to sign in and I want, basically, I don't want, you know, new instances spinning up when they are needed. I want them spinning up in advance so that that first user sign in is faster, et cetera. So this is, so that one is just, you know, natural, you know, natural evolution of what, uh, what we're seeing there. Yeah. So the, yeah. So with the Azure Arc stuff, there's, um, yeah, that's something that on the, on the Azure side to me, it's, like Azure Arc is way more interesting than um, than uh, Azure Stack HCI, but just because I, I view Azure Stack HCI as just being too too specific, and it's you know too narrow a a segment compared to people who want to connect Windows Server uh, to to Azure. Um, uh, but as we take a look at the Win three six five support, uh, TPM support, so that obviously. Windows 11 having that as a requirement is is one of the reasons uh, be, uh, behind that. Uh, but also the big one, and one of the things to notice here is, is I'm not putting public preview, private preview, or GA on any of these because I didn't want things to change uh, before I actually presented it. So, um, but yeah, I think most of these are probably still in some form of preview. Maybe a few of them has have crept out to to GA. But yeah, just have Win three six five with AAD join definitely you know makes it way more interesting for me. So having it a standalone wasn't you know wasn't perfect. But you know, and I guess you know if we're sort of thinking about SMB customers telling them that they need to deploy. You know that you know if they want you know something a bit more managed under the covers, you'd need to deploy AD. Probably not the greatest story. So this is so this is a big improvement. Uh, being able to report into your endpoint analytics uh, reports and as well as your Win Eleven Business Edition support. Now this is probably the this is our first official reference to Microsoft Three Six Five Business Premium in here. So those of you who don't know what Windows Eleven Business Edition is, you'll probably if you go through the Microsoft website, you'll eventually find something that will explain what it is to you. But think of it as Windows, either Windows 10 or Windows 11 Pro with a couple of enterprise features enabled when it's uh, AAD joined to a Microsoft 365 Business Premium environment. So basically it's just some of the additional security features uh, start to light up. Now, be careful there that it's it doesn't conv it doesn't give you all of the uh, uh, the enterprise capabilities. You don't get App Locker or you know quite a few. You don't get all of the asterisk guards, for example. Uh, but it just just sort of lights up a few additional a few additional scenarios if people do want to start locking their their Windows client devices down. Um, so with that one, it's uh, yeah. So if if someone's sort of looking at a price list, etc., going where's Windows 10 business or Windows 11 business, it's just the uh, the version that's in in M365, and I think I can probably even do I even have that. Let me just check if I can pull up a tenant. 
Now, Phil, you especially, please don't pay attention to this tenant that I'm about to bring up. Other people can look, but Phil has to look away. And I'm not going to. I'm not going to tell you why. It's it's better just to accept that things are what they are and move on. So I'll just get things up on screen and pull it across. Now let me just find the right account. Okay, so so here's so this is M three six five business. Here's a user that's got it assigned to them, and if we just expand that this one out, and if we come all the way down to uh, to Windows, notice in here it says Win ten Win eleven business. So so just with that one, it's the licensing here is fairly similar to your Windows ten slash eleven enterprise licensing, where your device have to, has to have that pro uh, that pro license uh, on the device before it's actually uh, you know before you can assign this to it. So it's not a clean OS install. It doesn't give you product keys to do uh, to do un you know, unattended installs or things like that. It's it's basically taking the OEM provided image of Pro and just doing that in place step up to business. Uh, uh, generally, yeah, effectively, the first time you're signing in with, with Azure AD, when it's checking, it sees the appropriate uh, checkbox in here and says, "Yep, we'll do that conversion for you." Yeah. And it only takes like adds seconds to that to that sign in. So over here, then, what you can now start reading into this is that it means that there's Windows 11 Business Edition uh, will be supported in Win365. Now, um, so I think so. What you'll so my guess here is, and I think I think this is what some of the announcements were saying uh, with that one was that you will start seeing things like um, like templates where your Win11 business, uh, you know, where basically you'll be able to go through and do. Win 11 business configurations, et cetera. Uh, but in reality, just choosing a Win, 10, a Win 10 Pro, actually no, because normally you'll see all the documentation talks about Win 365 requiring like a Win 10 enterprise license. So that's why they wouldn't give you a pro, a pro, uh, a pro type image in there. Now, as we move over to Endpoint Manager, there's a few things on here that um, are probably going to be ripe for future conversations. Um, so, uh, so I guess the like the first one that I've got listed on here is just the uh, the Linux um, desktop management side. So, uh, so finally, um, you know, yeah, Intune officially supports uh, supports Linux. Uh, so, I guess that means does it, actually maybe does that finally mean we're in the year of Linux on the on the desktop? Um, now, of course, the um, who wants to guess? what the first comments were in some of the posts that I, I was reading about Linux desktop management. What were the what were the first comments? So you know that it's not going to be someone saying fantastic or plus one. Does it support my random distribution? Uh, <laughs> no, 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 it didn't. But you're kind of you're you're almost on the right track. It's like why doesn't it do something else that's not part of this announcement? And that's something else. And I think this is something that I'm sure a few of you like have been asked repeatedly, especially if you're in education space. Is you know when is Intune going to support uh, Chrome OS? That and you know and that's one that like I think I've been hearing versions of that for you know, at least a few years. Yeah, definitely a few years now. Um, so, so then the second one is around, you know, additional Mac application deployment options. So instead of just being limited to PKGs, uh, now you can go through and you've got got a bit more flexibility there. So the the topic that we haven't actually done, and I think I'll have to reach out to someone outside of our usual scope. But if but if anyone thinks it's a topic that they would be more than happy to talk about, uh, is Intune or Endpoint Manager and Mac OS. That's something that is, it was requested. Uh, it, we, we've had it requested, but you know, I don't think uh, between Steve, Ben and I, like we just don't really, like nothing against Mac OS, we just don't do, do anything with it. Uh, so we just wouldn't be good people to, uh, to really uh, cover it in any detail. But um, if any of you sort of feel like putting your hand up for that, uh, if there's anything in particular that you'd like to, to cover off, um, and it doesn't just have to be around the app side of it. Uh, just I guess 
just some of the general pieces on on Mac OS uh, MDM support through Intune would really be the uh, the big ones. And I can see a few of you are typing in in here. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah. So that's what sort of things on Mac OS. So I, I I do a bit of well, I'm on a Mac right now. I do a bit of stuff around Mac OS, so I could so, potentially do it. So probably even just things like going through explaining like like sort of starting off pretty simple, just explaining things like, you know, some of the you know different enrollment um, mechanisms and then like, and I guess because the audience, you know, because most of the people on here are probably, you know, more Windows focused, probably, you know, but have to sort of jump in and do Mac support as well occasionally, like probably, you know, just sort of, you know, some of the things that are quite, you know, not, you know, what's better or, or what's worse between them, but just, you know, some of the differences and kind of, you know, the way you had to rethink, like, oh, this is how I would have done it on a Windows PC, but, you know, Macs don't have that, you know, that particular thing, but I was able to still get the desired outcome. So, yeah, so basically as flexible as it as you want it to be, it doesn't, you know, we don't need to hit, you know, hit certain talking points. It's whatever you uh, you need. You would, would you be talking about the new year? Not... Oh, yeah, not, not next month, no. So, yeah, so cool. sometime, yeah, sometime next year. So if you're yeah, so if you're happy to um, yeah, I think I could do that. Yeah, just got to find a customer environment that's got Apple Business Manager with actual Macs enrolled. I, th I think I've got one. Um, <laughs> yeah, because it's nearly all I yeah, it's nearly all their their phones and their tablets. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah, all it's, iOS. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. yeah, and I and I think that's been like that's the challenge that we've had is that like outside of education. And then so, but and then it was kind of an uphill battle if it was like an academic institution that was mostly using Macs. Intune may not have been the MDM solution they they went for. So so even the people who did have the right hardware didn't necessarily you know, weren't using the software that we wanted. So if anyone yeah you know, does sort of you know, encounter that, you sort of you you do want to sort of jump in so that way we can split the load if different people want to pick up different topics that's um like that's no problem at all yeah so yeah so even there yeah so even things such as the you know so like like you know why yeah so yeah perfect example and yeah phil and robert have dropped it in so things like you know like like if intune wasn't quite enough to meet your requirements if you've added you know if you added jamf what was it that jamf brought to the brought to the table uh, that kind of thing so a few more things then. So now we've got some custom compliance on Windows. So if you want to start building, uh, and I, so I think this lights up soon. I, I think I checked my portal a few days back and I didn't see it in there yet. Uh, but this is where if you, like, so if you sort of think about the things that are normally going to appear as part of, like, you know, what you could put into a, a device compliance uh, policy for a Windows device. Um, now for you to go through and basically start putting some of your own, uh, basically your own settings in there so that uh, if there are other particular, you know, things you're looking for, indicators from you know, particular software, et cetera, that they, they are things that you can start putting in. So just making sure that it's not just, you know, Microsoft's view of here's what a compliant device is, but also, you know, maybe what your organization uh, believes a compliance device should be. Now, the, the conditional access policy is targeting edge. Now, uh, and in this case on Linux. Now, I guess there's kind of, <laughs> that one's kind of a sneak peek. So why did that happen? Well, kind of a good thing, good announcement to go along with the Linux version of Edge now being uh, generally available. Uh, so I guess those two, I go hand in hand. So now we can start uh, targeting, uh, you know, CA, uh, CA on, on Linux devices as well. Now, the, uh, the final one on their connected cache um, no, it's not the announcement you thought the connected cache announcement might be, which is the um, the non-config manager version of connected cache. Um, now, Quok, Phil, or Phil, do you know how much is public around what that solution is actually going to look like? Because I'm not quite sure what I'm allowed to say about it. Because I'm not, I'm in that... That gray it's zone of what, what is was uh, blogged at Ignite. Um, was it February last year? Oh, so that's all this. Okay. Oh, okay. So, okay. I definitely can't. So, yeah, we haven't so done thing, anything since then. Okay. So, the thing that I can say is there's, it's taken forever for them to release it. So, they've been talking about it for like two years now. Um, and 
it's changed substantially in terms of the architecture from what the initial, like the initial conversations were, oh, it'll be a container that runs on Windows Server or to be like, yeah, enabling certain functionality on IIS, for example. Um, but the solution is actually starting to look. Um, and so by solution, if you're interpreting solution as meaning, meaning, does that mean there are more moving parts as opposed to one element? Uh, yeah, and it, it actually looks pretty, yeah, the, the technology side looks looks pretty good. Uh, but hopefully, yeah, hopefully we see some more public info on that one. Um, now, I guess, so I guess now it's just that the that connected cache, you know, it's not a preview feature. So even though I don't know any orgs that chose not to use connected cache because it was a preview feature, they either used it because they wanted it or they didn't use it because they felt they were getting similar capabilities out of, you know, or, you know, that they didn't necessarily view that it was going to give them much over, you know, if they were already using you know, branch cache, had local distribution points, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, but, you know, but it, it's not GA anymore. Oh, sorry, it's not preview. Uh, and it, that was preview for two, two or three years now. So that, yeah, that's been um, around for, uh, for quite a while. Um, and I'll actually do a little bit of a, we'll tie, yeah, I'll tie the connected cache conversation into something we'll talk about um, on the next slide. Now, just I'll just do a quick demo down here on the edge side of that cloud site management list, just to show you what it is. But but effectively, the edge list that you can publish, or the, the browser list that you can publish, that tells edge um, whether or tells Windows, whether or tells the browser whether it should be opening it up in you know, you know, that uh, this is something that should be opened up in a particular mode, for example, um, rather than it being something where you create an internal resource and point people through to it. Instead, now they've made, or you could still do it that way if you've already been doing it now, but what we could actually go through here and is basically go through, create our own site list, and effectively, uh, after we go through and create it, uh, we'd have the appropriate URL that we could then start publishing out to the uh, out to the devices. Uh, so, so just like, a, like it's not, like it's one of those things that is fairly simple, but just like I, to me, this is just a, like it's a, a really good convenience feature. Uh, so something where it's like, you know, why do we have to go through and you know create you know create a publishing location, etc., that's available when people are out and about? This is just saying, look, let's just publish it as part of you know uh, an O3 or an M365 service. So I really, so it's, I really like this one just because it's simplifying something that's already there as opposed to um, you know, trying to, you know, do something in a completely different way that's overly complicated. Okay, so moving on to some of the Windows update for business pieces. So a few different things here. So first of all, with the staged rollouts. Now, let me just walk you through a few things. And I was, I mentioned this a little bit last month, but it, and it still hasn't started to light up completely. But let's just talk about what it is, and that is the wrong browser. I've got 10 different browser profiles open for tonight. Um, so what was I looking for now? I've forgotten what I'm looking, looking for. I want endpoint. And so the reason why I'm not clicking on things in the browser at the moment up here was because the, the team sharing tab wouldn't, wouldn't automatically disappear. Okay, so if we just jump into devices, um, so I'm comfortable talking about this now because there is a blog post that shows screenshots of what I'm about to explain to you. Uh, so there's no no NDA violation or anything like that. But if we jump down to the feature updates for Windows 10, and we just say create a new profile, some of the things that you'll start seeing appearing in here moving forward will be um, just some some radio button choices around like what time frame do you want to start deploying these in? So rather than it sort of being let's push it out and have all devices do it as soon as they receive this, instead what it will do is start staggering when the the upgrades will take place on those devices. So that way you can sort of say I want it, you know, I want all of the updates to be done by this date, and it will just sort of go through and start you know, saying, okay, well, let's start scheduling it and you know, we'll make adjustments under the covers as needed to uh, to keep things on track. Uh, so uh, now, so even though it hasn't started to light up in the uh, in Endpoint Manager yet, 
uh, through um, Graph, uh, yeah, through Microsoft Graph and the PowerShell SDK, you can actually go through and start doing it under the uh, under the covers. So if you want to go through and script it, and that's all, that's I guess that's another important part of of this is now that you know Windows Windows Update for Business. If you do want to go through and do uh, go through and use PowerShell uh, Graph, etc., to go through and work with it, that's some, that that is something that is also available now. Uh, so if you do want to test that staggered update scheduling, uh, that that's definitely something you can do. The documentation should be. Uh, should be up on uh, up on docs already. Now the other things that I'll kind of tie the safeguard holds and the update compliance solution into a single conversation, and I'll just jump out to the out to the Azure portal for this one. So with this one, we can actually see this one, or we can see both of those elements in here. So here, all I've got open is the the log analytics workspace uh, for the, and I've, what I've got in here is the um, if we just jump down to solutions, I've got the uh, the was the, the main one we'll look at here is the the was updates insights. Now, if we there's a few different things we can take a look at here. So let's take a look at the traditional piece. Um, now, normally, if I show, I think I might have even shown this last month, but I showed it in my own tenant where there wasn't really anything to report in there because it doesn't. It basically, it's not getting the uh, any of the the details it needs if you're running Windows Insider. So in this case, this is a different tenant. I've spun up a few different VMs. Now we'll be using. You know, these are things that are, that I kind of just built out as part of some of the the other stuff that we'll talk about. But um, you know, I I decided that some of those people whose names you might be really familiar with. Just let me. Um, sign up before I bring it onto a screen for you. Um, like is, is everyone ready for the big reveal? And this will probably be more to some of you than others. But if I go to sign in, look look who it is. Um, so um, so in this case, I, I just set up Win 10 machines and had to sort of just absolutely prevent myself from going through and just letting them update to, uh, to Windows 11. And so it's not just Megan, uh, five of her friends from Contoso also have their own VMs down here as well, but we don't need to look too closely at them. Uh, so, so in this case, now that you know, none of them are on Insider, it means we actually start getting data reporting into here instead of a bunch of uh, blank stuff because it was, for my environment, it's pretty much all of them would be on Insider. Now in here, what I'll just show you quickly is that you know, things like, yeah, we've already sort of mentioned connected cache and like, you know, just sort of in reference to that being part of delivery optimization. And okay, for some reason it's showing up as nothing, but there should actually be a lot. Am I in the right tenant? I'm definitely in the right tenant, but for some reason, none of the data is lighting up that should be in there. And there should be a lot of data in there because I went through, actually, yeah, you can see that, yeah, you can see that it's recognizing the devices, but for some reason it, it nulled out all the data, I actually had data in there before. So I don't know why that didn't actually show up in here. Okay, so let's just take a step back then. Let's let's pretend I didn't show that to you because that can go anywhere. Um, so I'm sure if I let me just do the usual. Let's just hit refresh because that that always works, except when it doesn't. Okay, so I don't know why that's not showing up. It was showing up earlier um, because and there, there's plenty of there should be should have been. Plenty of data and maybe about 80 to 82% bandwidth savings in there. Now, what I really just wanted, what I, I guess the main thing that I do want to show you in here is two of the workbooks that were added into this solution. So the first one is the Windows 11 uh, readiness status. Now, for this one, it's I guess the way to look at this is if somebody's not using like Config Manager, if they're not using Intune, but they still want to start getting some reporting from Microsoft around you know, what devices are or aren't capable of running Windows 11. What you can see in here is that it's telling me what the breakdown is. 
And, and you can kind of notice here that six VMs kind of just happens to correspond, or six corresponds to the number of VMs that I just showed you. Um, but I went through and just configured, after I configured a few of them, I realized I should actually configure them, one of them slightly differently. So I've got five of them that support secure boot, but don't have a TPM. But then I've got one that I uh, deployed as a, uh, I think it's still a Gen 2 VM, uh, but I didn't enable uh, secure boot on it, but I did enable a TPM. So that way you can see that it, it's basically saying that, you know, that's the reason why it's not coming through. And then we can go through and see, you know, what the, you know, what the issues are and, and you know, what the, what the potential deployment blockers might be. So this is just, you know, somewhere where you can get that data. And like the thing that's nice about this is that the, any of the data that's getting fed into this is zeroed out at the end of the month. And look, the reality is it's probably like, a couple of cents for a smaller organization to a large to a couple of dollars for an incredibly large organization. The you know, the costs of this solution are are pretty much, uh, you know, even if you were being charged for it, it wouldn't be the kind of thing to worry about. But if you're already using like, you know, uh, you yeah, know, desktop analytics, endpoint analytics, etc., you're probably already going to be getting a lot of this data. But um, for somebody who doesn't, you know, just like trying not to assume that people have always have those tools, this is a way they can start at least getting some of that data. Now, the other thing here, and I just need to click out of workbooks and then back into workbooks again. If we just come here into safeguard holds, now what this will do is start showing what devices aren't receiving um, Windows 11 through Windows Update for Business due to an identified block. So whether it's you know, maybe you know, certain devices that, um, you know, even though technically they're capable of running Windows 11, there might still be something uh, in particular with those devices with, you know, specific firmware, uh, you know, certain models. Now, I think there were, like, even with Surface devices, like, there are always, you know, staggered releases of when, you know, different, you know, different versions of or different yeah, editions of Surface devices will get updates. So, so right now, there's, you know, I don't, these are just VMs. There's nothing... Uh, that's actually preventing them from being upgraded. If I wanted to do the the appropriate uh, the appropriate work in there, so so this is uh, yeah. So this is there. It's uh, and again, like it's it's a freebie service, but you do need to have an Azure subscription for it. Um, and if someone like if someone didn't already have an Azure subscription, and you know weren't using they weren't using Intune or Endpoint or Config Manager. I'm guessing that they're probably not really relying on Microsoft tools all that much. So, so I guess that's one of the things why sometimes I struggle with some of the other components. But if someone you know wants just wants different ways of getting access to data, I just like you know a, a no cost solution to allow you to get access to that one. So that covered off the other. So that covered off the safeguard holds and the update compliance solution. So last month. Uh, yeah, I mentioned that those uh, some of those changes were coming through, and they they have actually started to light up. So now moving on to Microsoft Defender for Business. So the so let's just sort of talk about what it you know what the name is versus I guess potentially the way that people might choose to interpret it, myself included. Now um, <laughs> we haven't spoken actually on the next slide. We start talking about some of the name changes that have, have gone ahead. But the I guess the important thing to take note of here in terms of the naming is it is not Microsoft 365 Defender for Business. So if it was called Microsoft 365 Defender for Business, how would you interpret that? Because I would interpret, I would I could choose to interpret it very differently to what this one is. So come on, come on, Phil, come on, Quok. Isn't that um, Defender for the Business Premium SKU? So, so this one is. So this is yeah. So this is the. So this is Defender for Endpoint, but the SMB edition, as opposed to if they called it Microsoft 365 Defender, then as soon as you see, so if you sort of think about Microsoft 365 Defender, that's more of you know generally that's more of the all up. Uh, all of the M365 related defenders would normally be part of that type of conversation. Whereas in, the, in this case, it's it's a third skew of defender for endpoint. Uh, so instead of it being, so it's not, 
So at first when I was looking at this, I was going, oh, is this, is this what P1 ended up being branded? But no, so this is overall, this has got more functionality than P1. But if you take a look at the restrictions, 300 seats or less, which aligns perfectly with M365 business premium, or just the M365 business plans in general, 300 seats or less is what they're targeting. Now, the only thing that's, that at least from the information I've seen so far that seems to be missing is the threat experts um, piece. So if we sort of tie back to the conversation we had a couple of months back when we were talking about uh, Defender for Endpoint P1, one of the things that I noted in there is that if you take a look at the things that were removed, they're the things that generally are going to require people, like in terms of, you know, back end, you know, people in the back end you know, providing additional manual assistance or analysis, et cetera. So, so in this case, this is one that, um, like I'm actually surprised at how little they seem to have pulled out of it. Now, the thing that I guess I'll have to wait and see is, is it at the, to yeah, at the top level section, is it only MTE, uh, or sorry, is it only, yeah, threat experts that's been removed or are there any other restrictions underneath that. So like, is there anything that's been stripped out of EDR or anything along those lines? And I didn't read anything that suggested that was the case, but they also didn't necessarily state, like there was no statement saying it was everything from MTE. Where I, oh, sorry, from Threat Experts. The, the reason why I came to that conclusion was purely based on the diagram where, yeah, those of you who've seen the Defender for Endpoint, like where it sort of shows you all of the capabilities in a, uh, like in a, in a, uh, I guess a, a diagram, um, that was the thing that, that was missing. So there could be more, like there could be like the odd feature here or there that's not there, but I just couldn't see anything that was like a comprehensive uh, comparison of it versus endpoint P2 um, or even, even endpoint P1. But either way, good news, like, I guess the, like, the good news here is, is that regardless of what's in or what's out, is that anyone who's already got M365 business premium uh, gets this as uh, gets this for free, so it just starts lighting up in the in the skew. Um, so this is yeah. So this one ends up yeah being you know I guess it like it's been a while since there have been any like major additions to M365 Business Premium apart from things that have sort of been incrementally added to the underlying services. But this is something where you know, where all of a sudden it um, you know it starts getting these additional capabilities rolling into it. So for me that's yeah, you know, that's a fantastic story. And even going back to the, the early days of when, when it was still Microsoft 365 business, when it was first introduced, um, the thing that was always the big, the big weakness originally was that the way that it was, it was kind of presented as giving you these additional defender capabilities. Um, but all it would really was, was that you'd be using Intune to go through and configure <laughs> configure the policies for Defender and, you know, enabling, you know, the cloud protection and that kind of stuff, which you could have done without Intune. Uh, you know, you could have used other things for that. Um, but yeah, but this time around, it's, you know, this is a good addition and hopefully we start seeing that stuff um, light up. So, yeah, so for that one, it was, um, yeah, it, yeah, it's, and I, yeah, and the, and the big downside of it, and so I've got, I can, I think I should be okay to talk about this stuff now. Enough, enough time has passed. Um, so the M365 business team, so going back a long time, have been pushing really hard to get something out of the Defender team. Now, the so the early challenges that they had there were, you know, basically the, you know, we can't give them full-blown Defender just because of the, you know, as a as a service, it was something that at the time needed it's even though yes there's a big technology element but it still needed additional people for that service to be able to scale properly or the overall capabilities of that the service included including threat experts etc um so now so and i think at the time one of the issues was was that they didn't really have ways of you know pulling certain services in or out of of it it's it's you had Defender for it was still WDATP at the time, so you either had that or you didn't. But now with P, the D Defender for Endpoint P1, you can already see that they've already figured out. You know, they've basically rearchitected things so that they can offer you some elements of the overall service as opposed to giving you everything. For example, 
and now the defender for business just sort of leverages some of some of that ability, some of that granularity. Um, but the so yeah, so the big things that were really missing, it wasn't, and even though people, you know, it was at the point where people were starting to gain trust in defenders' capabilities. Um, the challenge was was that it didn't provide any kind of centralized reporting, which every other SMB vendor provided in their solution. Uh, so so people said, look, like like we trust that it does its job, but we want to see you know what devices have, uh, are here seeing issues, what users are problematic, et cetera. There was no way to, to see that stuff. So so this kind of fills a, a pretty big uh, you know, pretty big gap there. And hopefully, you know, for people who have sort of stuck with their preferred you know, SMB EDR solution. Hopefully, this is something that can make them uh, rethink that one. Um, yeah, but yeah, but not even being able to see, like, if you sort of think about it, not even being able to see what devices had that Defender was enabled. Or actually, you could have seen. I guess you could have done that through compliance, but you couldn't even see like where signatures up to date, etc. Um, now, just a quick thing that I'll show you though is where you could still get some of that information. And one of the reasons why I would have recommended things like the update analytics. Now you're not going to see it on this tenant, but I'll explain something that okay, wrong tenant. Uh, let me pull up the right one. If we just sort of actually, if we just jump back into overview and summary, there's a missing box from from here that I'll, I'll just sort of tell you here because if you Go and find screenshots of it. What you'll find is that instead of it having, I think, four, three or four boxes, it will have four or five across here. So that, yeah. So instead, so notice that there's something missing down here. Now, what's missing down there is your Windows Defender status. But the reason why that's not showing up in here isn't because of the, the reason why delivery optimization stuff's not there. No, the reason why it's not there is because I'm using this tenant's got Defender for Endpoint, so therefore it pulls that out saying, well, you're not going to look at Defender settings if you're using uh, Defender for Endpoint. So that would be one way that you could actually see the status, but not really an integrated solution. And it also meant that if you were an M365 business user who didn't have an Azure subscription, you would have needed an, an Azure subscription for this uh, you know, which you know, some people would have just pushed back on a bit. Yeah, so Phil, so yeah, so that, yeah, so that image uh, that, that is part of that. Um, look, now we get an Office 365 ATP demo. They had the wrong name. That's why I said the wrong name. Um, yeah, so this, so basically this is the table that I went by. So notice, so if you sort of take a look at this one, the thing that's missing is threat experts. Uh, whereas if you take a look at the P1, it's got a few other things uh, uh, blocked out on it. So, so like I said, they're not specifically saying that it does everything, but they're also not, so they, yeah, they're not really telling you what it does or doesn't do, but I'm guessing eventually we'll get a nice table that's going to have the, uh, the exact uh, differences. Uh, but, you know, for now, hopefully, you know, we can sort of, even the fact that we, that, something is being added is, to me that's that's enough of a positive um even though okay obviously whatever it is that's missing would obviously be the number one thing that somebody personally requires if it only had this one more one more feature okay so so let's just go back um to the slide so yeah so with defender for business um that's yeah to me that was a a big win and i had a chat with I, she's no longer on the um, Microsoft 365 business team, uh, but I had a chat with the person that I would, like this would have been a conversation around three or four years ago, and I was like, "Oh, your dream, your dream has finally come true," and she was like, "Oh yeah, like a lot of a lot of hard work went into making sure this uh, this one happened." So let's move on to the final couple of announcements, and really, it was some of the name changes, which is. Um, <laughs> So first of all, you know, the Microsoft 365 Defender, probably like the main one here that really makes, yeah, that makes sense is Cloud App Security has now been renamed as Defender for Cloud Apps. So yeah, so this one to me was kind of a long overdue one because like for the last year, we've been seeing slides that have been, you know, Microsoft 365 Defender, Defender for Identity, Defender for Endpoint, uh, Defender for Office 365. Microsoft, and then final bullet point was Microsoft Cloud App Security. So that so this brings this brings consistency. So that's one that I think is yeah that's that's a good change. No 
no complaints about it at all. However, um, there is also now Microsoft Defender for Cloud, which was which is basically the combined security center plus Azure Defender. Um, so I can see where this is going to cause, or whenever there's this kind of thing that causes confusion, the conclusion that I've come to that I'm happily ha happy to say publicly. Um, now it's probably not something that Phil or Quop, for example, would be able to say in public, but generally the more people complain about product names that are similar to each other, the less they know about the products overall. Um, so yeah, so someone who's going, oh, look at all of these things that all start with Defender, that's really confusing. And it's like, now if you actually know what the products is, ah, it allows you to have easy, convers easy conversations because if I'm, like, if I'm talking to Phil about Defender for Endpoint, I am not saying Defender for Endpoint. I'm saying, end, you know, I'm just saying you know, Endpoint after the first sentence, for example. Um, so, so in this case, I think that's a good one. Now there is Cloud App Discovery on Mac OS. Now we will take a look at uh, at Cloud App Discovery in just a moment. We can we can even tie that into some of the data we're already getting through into Sentinel, not from Mac OS obviously, but from Windows. But I'll show you um, how that stuff works. But then the the Defender for Cloud. Um, now you can kind of see that like this one is the one that I think is probably going to get the most criticism because people are going to be you know, going to look at it and go, how can they have two things that are that are so so similarly named and it's like you must be new to this if if you're upset that two things are, that have got names that are very similar to each other it's like yeah after a few years you kind of just go it doesn't doesn't matter um but overall with the microsoft defender for cloud the the reason why it's such a generic thing cloud is that it's not just around your you know what you're doing in azure it's not just about what you're doing on prem but also Cloud, as in AWS, GCP, and I guess if they want to extend it out to you know other cloud providers in the, in the future. So it's just that this is the more of the all up thing. So the Azure Defender naming was was removed. So so even here, it's kind of like what we've seen where things like even if we talk about Intune, originally it was Windows Intune, but they had they basically they had to make it Microsoft Intune because it it wasn't just targeting Windows. Um, so you know calling it Azure Defender. Yeah, made people think it only supported Azure when in fact it, you know, it was a lot, a lot broader there. So hopefully these names stick around <laughs> for a while. Um, you know, I don't think anyone's willing to to make any of those promises, but I guess the, you know, we're at a, we're at a point now where there's actually really good consistency with these uh, with these names. Um, now, what the I guess the downside is is if you think of all of the different products. Or capabilities that have got a defender for in their name, that is a really, really big list. And we'll we'll be able to take a look at a few of those as we you know, as we go through. So so then I guess before we do switch gears and then jump into the uh, the Sentinel conversation, um, just anything else that anyone saw at Ignite that was of you know that that they enjoyed or that they yeah, you know, any announcements that are going to hopefully make your life easier. Like anything in particular that jumped out at you. Now there was, sorry, someone was about to say something, I think. It's probably me going off mute and getting uh, feedback. Um, oh, okay. There was um, uh, endpoint DLP support on Mac OS. So I, I haven't looked at it in, in detail, but um, I think that'll certainly be interesting to be able to apply uh, DLP policies consistently across Windows and Mac OS. Oh, actually, and that reminds me of something that I didn't realize had occurred. So, um, so back when Endpoint DLP was first introduced, uh, you needed you actually ne it needed to be done via Defender for Endpoint. Whereas um, when it went GA, which I think was a year ago now, uh, I think that Defender for Endpoint uh, requirement was removed, and that was something that I hadn't realized changed until somebody told me a couple of months ago. Um, I guess it kind of tells you how much I do with, with DLP. <laughs> so let me just scroll back up. There was something else in here. Who was it who mentioned alt space? Someone mentioned alt space VR up in chat earlier, I think. Yeah, I, uh, I had a, a very brief mention of it. I joined that session and uh, it 
is a bit out there. Yeah, so so probably the so the so the really big learning about alt space VR uh, was that, uh, and even on my own lightly managed devices, whatever policies I had in place was blocking me from using alt space VR. So I could I could sign into alt space VR using like a consumer account, but it wouldn't load my avatar and wouldn't let me enter any of the rooms. And that seemed to be impacting a lot of people. So, um, so there's, yeah, so there's something like, like whether, like, I don't know if it's like something related to like any firewall settings I've got, whether it's something in Defender for Endpoint that was causing the issue. Uh, but a lot of, basically a lot of people like were having issues getting in because they had, you know, because if you think about it, a lot of the people would have been joining from, you know, end of day in the US still at work for some of, some of those. And the basically not being able to join from their, their corporate PC, which of course was the only PC they had with them. So I think there's a few, you know, before the next next round or be, like for the next event, um, like unless they've got specific guidance around, here's what needs to be open in order for these to work, you'll probably see guidance where it basically needs to be, you know, a consumery type setup as opposed to a managed device, which hopefully they can address some of that stuff before the next Ignite though, because that's some of that messaging won't be great. And I think some of the problem too is the fact you're a little bit blindsided. You joined a Teams chat and they said, well, here's a step off point to go and download Alt Space VR. Yeah, yeah. And people were, were coming in cold, whereas if you knew in advance, you could have dealt with some of those issues and then been productive. Yeah, so even for me, like, so, because I, I spent way too much time to, trying to troubleshoot what the issue was before, because I didn't want to just turn everything off to see if it worked. I was trying to just sort of find particular settings, and it just got to the point where I just, like, reset a PC I haven't used for a while and just had, like, a, a vanilla. I kept it on Wing 10 in case Wing 11 was the issue, um, and, yeah, and got it working. But, yeah, it's, yeah, definitely a few, um, yeah, a few a few lessons for that one, but you know, it, it won't be, you know, it'll be better communicated in advance next time is probably the best way to think about it. And I can see either Phil's typing something or he was typing something or he's stepping away. Oh, okay, Phil's going, okay, so thanks Phil and might potentially even see you in person at some point soon. I hope so, mate. Yeah, I yeah. really hope so. Doing okay. a great job as always. See you. Oh, thanks, Phil. Catch you later. Okay, so so then anything else that people saw, uh, any of the announcements, or like how many of you didn't join sessions because like it wasn't as time time zone friendly this time round? How many of you did join sessions? I want to see if anyone's awake. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 Actually, yeah. Yeah. Obviously, Eddie. Eddie did. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so let's jump in now and talk about some of the the sentinel uh, pieces that I wanted to talk about. And what I really wanted to focus on here was, I guess, like. So it's kind of it's a, it's based on a few conversations I've had around the last few years where you know where I kind of you know you put you you put your foot in your mouth by making assumptions and saying things and you go oh hang on there are people that some of this stuff doesn't apply to so I've got to think of other ways of doing things so so when it comes to building out a sentinel environment like it's really easy to show somebody how to build a sentinel environment um, because it's you know they you can have it up and running, you know, following a pretty basic guide without without any real issues. Um, you know, uh, as long as you've got the appropriate subscriptions or you can create them. But what happens though when the focus starts to change a bit? Saying, look, I want to learn about Sentinel, but I don't want I don't have an existing subscription I can use. Um, like I might be able to use a trial subscription where I get something for free for the first month, but then other things will start costing me money after that. So what I was trying to sort of figure out were what are ways that at least from the from the Microsoft 365 side, what are some ways that we could basically do like Sentinel dirt cheap as a like for a learning environment as opposed to it, you know, being you know, being something production. So if we just sort of take a look at 
you know, first of all, you know, why differentiate in, you know, right at the beginning between test and production is, uh, so the so the main one that I've sort of mentioned here is, is the pricing side. Um, so, yeah, so that's going to be the driving factor behind some of the things that we will, uh, we will talk about here. But also with something like Sentinel, if you're learning it and your organization has already got some of these workloads connected into other same solutions, maybe your org has already got, is already running um, Sentinel in production. Yeah, that means that, you know, you're not just going to be able to click buttons and get, you know, get the, all those same data sources coming into yours, for example. So some of the, some of the benefits here is, is that it's isolated. So anything that you mess up, it doesn't affect your production Sentinel environment. But I, I prefer to sort of take it even further and say, you know, have it in a completely separate subscription if you like, or if you can, um, but also, you know, things such as, you know, what, you know, what, what roles, what permissions do you have in that as your subscription to prevent you from doing anything that could cause issues elsewhere. Um, so, so if we sort of start off just by going, okay, well, what if we're sort of starting with a clean slate uh, and we want to get, we want to set up a new Azure subscription of some type and a new Microsoft 365 subscription of some type. What are some of the things that we can start taking into account? So, uh, and then other things that play an important part of this is how long you want to keep that environment around for is also going to play a factor in how much things cost. Uh, so certain services will have like 30 day free periods for certain things. There might be other services where you can get certain things for free for the first 90 days, for example. So how do you start leveraging um, you know, some of those things? Now, other things you need to think about is if this is, if this is disconnected from your production environment, you're not going to be able to easily get the data sources that your production environment has got. And this will, you'll start seeing what this really means when we, when we do go in and start taking a look at some of the at some of the, the connectors that are in there. Now, you also need to be aware that sometimes there are going to be differences in trial versions of products that aren't necessarily documented. And I'll walk you through one that I eventually found. It was one where it was driving me nuts because I couldn't get something working. Found a blog post that mentioned something, or I, no, it was a tech community response uh, that, that sort of identified what the issue was but didn't uh, mention a fix, uh, but then I eventually figured out a way to work around the restriction without doing anything of dubious um, or suspicious um, with suspicious intent. It's legitimate. It works, and and uh, I'll walk you through what that one that one is as we go through. Also, you know, by keeping test and production separate, you're not going to accidentally be exposed to you know, any any kind of data that you, you really shouldn't be. And then the other thing as well is when it comes to test configuration VMs. So, so if they want you to test certain things in a particular VM, you don't want that VM connected to a VNet uh, in your own, or, your, or to a physical network in your own environment because you're kind of deliberately deploying VMs that aren't well configured in order to trigger certain alerts in, you know, to, to get them to report through to Sentinel. And, you know, those, those really aren't the kinds of machines that you want exposed, you know, <laughs> to the internet or in your, or, or to your production environment. So, uh, yeah, so basically another good reason to keep things separate. Now, just kind of the disclaimer in here is that, um, you know, this is like, so, so first of all, if you sort of think about the framework that, that we're talking about here for, what is it we're looking at Sentinel for? Primarily here, we're looking at low cost Sentinel test environments that we might want to use either for the short term or for long term purposes, uh, but primarily for ingesting information from Microsoft 365. So, uh, so uh, of, 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 and more specifically from the M365 Defender family. Uh, it doesn't mean it's the only things you can do with it, but they're really the the big things that are that are the target of this. Just to sort of keep it more aligned with, you know, yeah, the the man the device management uh, and user management side of things. So let's just start off with the with the Azure sub subscription. So all up, it doesn't really matter what type of Azure subscription you have. So you can see here I've got free student Azure Pass, Visual Studio benefits, internal usage rights. Yeah, it could be you know a paid subscription. It could be via CSP. It could be part of your enterprise agreement. The type of Azure subscription doesn't really matter. The thing that is important, though, is that 
it needs to be the same Azure AD tenant that your Microsoft 365 subscription is going to be part of. Uh, otherwise, just you know, a bunch of the inbuilt connectors for M365 are not going to work because they expect everything to be sitting in uh, in one tenant. Now, the other thing as well that like, if you're new to Azure, maybe it's not the thing you do on day one, but it's something maybe you want to look at over time is uh, so, you know, if you think about preventing accidental deployment of higher charge solutions, there's kind of a couple of things I've got in mind when I say that. One of them could potentially be, be deploying, uh, you know, uh, policies in Azure to prevent you from, or to basically to restrict the kinds of things you can deploy. So to make sure that you're not accidentally deploying VMs into this environment when you are trying to minimize costs. Because deploying VMs is generally not a way to keep it at cents per day uh, kind of thing. And that's kind of the target here is, you know, a cents per day approach to, uh, to Sentinel. Um, now on the Microsoft 365 E5 side, um, just because it says E5 does not mean it's the same as what another E5 might be. Now, let me just give you, let's actually, let's start off with what I think for most of you is probably going to be the best starting point like in terms of like, if you're going to build it around a Microsoft 365 environment and then add a an Azure subscription to it, probably the best fit there is going to be your, um, let me just check what account name is this. Okay, so this is one that I've just created with a Microsoft 365 developer subscription. So you can spin those up, they're free of charge, you get them for a year. If there's activity or at least enough activity in them, they will potentially renew them for you. Uh, so kind of sounds kind of good. Now there's a couple of gotchas. The first thing here is if we actually just take a look at what's included with the license. Um, There's really one primary thing at first that is the kind of an important thing that is missing from this one. So if we go into the Microsoft 365 Defender site, so if I just search for Defender, you'll see there are five hits. Let's just go through them. So M365 Defender, Defender for Identity. Um, now the, the reason why they're lighting up twice there is you're kind of wondering why on earth would I add EMS to the user if they've also got M365 V5? That's part of a workaround. Um, so basically you can see here that it's it doesn't have Defender for Endpoint. So if I type in Endpoint, it's, so yeah, so basically that's showing you that I don't have, uh, yeah, that I don't have that. So even here notice that, you know, it's saying Microsoft 365 E5 developer, even though it's saying without Windows and audio conferencing, so that means it's not gonna convert your pro uh, win, you know, win licenses to to enterprise when they're they're joining, for example. Uh, not that one's easily. You can work around that one pretty easily through other means. Um, but yeah, just notice that it's not this. It's not the same. Now the good news is that at least at this point in time. Now these are things that always come with a huge asterisk because these things change. Um, and uh, any of you who've sort of gone through and searched for different services and yeah, through different types of tenants have found that sometimes services will be available to add, other times they won't be available. But right now, one of the things that is available, and I haven't gone through the full process yet, but notice that I can add a Defender for Endpoint P2 trial. So if I jump into that and say, it's up to 25 users, start free trial. So I almost clicked on that earlier today, but I thought, no, I just wanna hold it here just in case, because I want to make sure that this actually proceeds. Now, what you'll find is that not everything can be added to this tenant as a trial, but I think that's just something that's, you know, different tenants are going to allow you to add, add different things. Now, good news, it is a three month trial, not a one month trial. So all, all goodness. So we've got a long-term M365 E5 developer subscription. We can plug the initial gap of Defender for Endpoint with a three month term of trial. Now, fingers crossed, because I haven't actually been through this process yet to make sure that it actually works. Um, so let me just try that. So I used to have all of the URLs for things that wouldn't necessarily show up, and I could drop the URL and I could magically add subscriptions that weren't appearing, but they started blocking all of those. Um, so so now if we jump in and we take a look at the uh, the products that I'm licensed for, 
ignore the EMS and Azure AD licenses in here. Oops. Show me something here, please. Okay, so, so there you can see we've got Defender for Endpoint. Yeah, and the thing that Eddie called out is that, yeah, sometimes you can go through and extend things even for, uh, even further. So um, so some of the other things that you, that you can also do in some of these situations is if we just go back to purchase services, if I do a search for Windows, let's see if anything, oops, that dropped a few characters there. What I'm hoping I see here is Windows 10 E5, and I am not seeing Windows. I'll just try Windows E5, see if that brings anything up. The EMS? No, okay, now it's only showing Windows. Okay, E3 is not gonna cut it. So what I was hoping is if it had Windows 10 E5 for another trial, then that would be another way you could extend your Defender for Endpoint. Um, so the yeah, so this is um, yeah. So so there are ways that you can do it, and I'll also show you. An, I'll talk about another way that you can get it uh, get Defender extended as well if you want to. But there are several asterisks that we have to talk about from that one. Just because it technically technically will do certain things doesn't mean you're actually licensed to do those things. And I don't want to you know tell you to do something that is going to to violate any any licensing especially seeing that the session is being recorded. Okay, so that way we've got those, those services in there. Now the, so now the other thing as well is that for the, the reason, let me just talk about the reason why I've got Azure AD Premium P2 and EMS, but let me show you via a, a different method, a different reason. I'll show you something slightly differently here to tell you the story as to why I have added those in. Because you'd think if we've already got M365 E5 and the user has already got Azure AD Premium assigned, you'd think anything Azure AD Premium would work. Uh, yes, you would You would definitely think that, but you would be quite wrong. Now, let me just turn off um, dark mode here, just because I know that for some people, dark mode just doesn't work, um, which means that if I go to white to light mode, everyone just sort of be prepared. Your screen's going to get really bright. Um, so let's just jump over to Sentinel. And this was something that was just driving me, driving me nuts. And I figured out, at least for now, a way to solve the solve the issue. Uh, so let me just filter based on now. This isn't the main tenant. I only got part way through this one because I sort of I hit a wall with this tenant and went, but now I know what I need to do to, to address it. So I actually switched over to another one to try to avoid the issue, but hit the same issue anyway. So let's just jump into Azure AD. Uh, so this is just the Sentinel connector. Now let's just open that so we can sort of drilling it a bit here on the data. So all we really want to look at here are the sign-in logs and the audit logs. Now this is showing you effectively that I've, that I've had it enabled for at least a week now. So the thing to take a look at here though is I've got audit logs coming through from Actually, this one is showing something different to what I want to show here. Um, let me check, unless it's retroactively pulled it out. Sorry, so let, I need to just quickly switch to a different tenant, because of course the one I've pulled up now isn't showing the behavior that I want. Let's just jump into Sentinel. We'll go back into data connectors. Okay, so it looks okay. So it looks like it's actually pulled in some of the old. So, what actually happens here is it's it's kind of hard to see now because of what's happening up here because it's been pushed up so far. But if you <laughs> let me really try to zoom in and hopefully it actually does show what I want it to show. Um, Okay, so notice that I'm getting audit log traffic, but I'm not actually getting any sign-in traffic 
until there. So what the issue was is if you're using that M if you're using an M365 E5 trial of any type, it doesn't matter if it's M365 E5 developer or just M365 trial, um, audit logs will light up, but sign-in logs will not light up, even though you've got the appropriate Azure AD licensing. What I found I had to do was not just go through and enable an Azure AD P1 or P2 trial. And in this case, I just chose, I thought, oh, let's just try to make sure we can do anything to make it work. I added the EMS trial from here and I added the Azure AD Premium P2 trial. It still didn't light up. And then I had a brilliant idea. Why don't I assign those to a user to see if that makes a change? And all of a sudden, the Azure AD sign-in logs started coming up. So then I went back to that other that M365 developer tenant, tried the same thing, and it and it worked at that point. So important things to note here is it doesn't sound right when I say it, but if you're what you'll see is is that your audit logs will sign will basically light up immediately, uh, but or close to immediately, but sign-in logs won't won't in a trial account won't light up until you go through a couple of extra steps. So it's a little bit of a mess, but it's a good, dis it's a good discovery though. Um, and, the, and, and as you can see here, it's the sign-in logs where you're getting the vast majority of data as opposed to your, to your audit logs. So they're really the ones that you do want to, to have, have to come into it. So they're just a few extra steps that you'll, you'll need to, to go through. So, so just sort of bear in mind there is, is that different subscriptions are going to give you some slightly different capabilities and you may need to go through and do, you know, add the Azure AD and EMS E5, oh, AAD P2, EMS E5 trials, and then assigning. So I don't know which one of them it was that assigning it that made things start working, uh, but yeah, I'm happy that I, I just figured out what the option uh, was to, to get that going. So now the, so then the other thing as well then is that if you're starting off just with that M365 subscription, so regardless of what type you've got, just go through and add and as, just go to like portal.azure.com and add, add the appropriate subscription type to it. Uh, now there's a few different options that, that you've got there. Now, if you're, I don't know if you'd be able to create like an as like you might be able to create an Azure free trial from that same subscription. I've, I've, I've never tried doing that. Instead, all I've done here is because I've got a bunch of, um, I had a bunch of um, Azure passes that were about to expire. I just went through and I was using those for some of this testing. Uh, so some of the things to watch out for though, when you do add an Azure subscription to an M365 tenant, so yes, technically they're both AAD tenants, but um, what you'll find is that it, it will basically give you, in, depending on what type of M365 subscription you've got, you might just end up with like billing admin rights over in the Azure side. Uh, so you need to go through and start just assigning yourself some of the appropriate permissions to perform the tasks that you need. So just watch out for that one because you'll be trying to de uh, deploy, uh, deploy resources in Azure and it will say, <laughs> you can't do this. You don't have the appropriate uh, permissions to do so. So just little things to, to watch out for. So just a few little time-saving bits there. Um, so, just to sort of document some of those things that, that I, I just mentioned here is that, um, you know, so the M365 trials don't seem to allow that, uh, oh, sorry, it's not activity log. That should just pretend these say sign-in logs. Um, so, so, yeah, so basically an activity log works pretty much no problem, but sign-in logs requires the, the additional trials and to be assigned to a user. Now, the reality is it could have just been a timing issue where, but I really doubt it would take a week for the AAD logs, sign-in logs to start coming through. Um, yeah, too much of a coincidence that it happened shortly after I added the other licenses. Now, I mentioned for M365 V5 developer that Defender for Endpoint's not there. Now, another thing that you can do here, and I mentioned this one as an alternative approach, is if you are going to be, and if you wanted to be doing testing on Windows Server inside of Azure for some of this stuff, as opposed to Windows Client, Defender for Endpoint is included as part of your Defender for Servers uh, subscription. And Defender for Servers is, or Defender, uh, sorry, your Microsoft Defender for Cloud, which Defender for Servers is part of. Sounds like Inception. Um, like that's free for the first 30 days. So that's a way that it would, it will actually, that first server that you add, and as long as you've got it configured to automatically deploy, um, uh, uh, to, to go through and deploy and enroll, 
it will actually spin up your Defender for Endpoint uh, environment for you. And then uh, you can basically go out to security.microsoft.com like after, after a few hours and actually sign in and you're, you're good to go. Uh, so, and, uh, so if you've got any questions around that, let me, let me know. But just be careful here is, is that it's, um, you know, the, the licensing for what is here is on the server side. Now, could I go into like settings, endpoint, uh, grab the, or, and then start grabbing the uh, deployment package and you know, drop that onto a Windows 10 machine or enable integration with Defender, or sorry, with Intune. I could, and it would work, but remember, you're not licensed for it. So try to stick to the licensing uh, here. Now, the other thing that's not included if you are using M365 developer um, is that Win10 Enterprise isn't there, but you can get that through Eval Center. So that, that's not really a big deal. And for the M365 Enterprise E5 trial, now for this one, let's expand that out. So you might just be using a trial, like just going up to Microsoft.com and signing up for a trial. Alternatively, like how many of you use, so if, I guess so this won't make any sense to those of you who don't work for a Microsoft partner, for example, but like any of you who work for a Microsoft partner, like have you ever used like the demo environments like from demos.microsoft.com or cdx.transform.microsoft.com? Have any of you used those? So they, yeah, so they'll still, yeah. So if you haven't used them, just think of it, it's kind of like what you saw over on the M365 developer where we get to choose what gets populated into it. So the same advice applies in terms of needing to add in that AAD slash EMS trial. So that's just a way you can get a bunch of users and a bunch of like Office 365 data into that environment um, right, out of, right out of the gate. So, as you start setting the, the tenant up, so let's say you've got the subscription under control uh, or both subscriptions under control. Um, so enable M365 Defender before you deploy Sentinel. So that way, when it's time for you to go and add the M365 Defender connector, it's all it's all configured and it's ready to go. And you know, and configuring Defender, uh, like when you say you know enable Microsoft 365 Defender, it does take a few minutes for it to go through and process that. So you can go through and just yeah you know, kick that off and then come back to it later. Now, the other thing to, you know, to make sure that you're doing is, like, if you are going to be enrolling Windows client devices, is you know, jump into uh, you know, Endpoint Manager and just enable the uh, Defender for Endpoint integration under security. Now, one of the things that was good for me going through and doing a couple of these different environments from almost from scratch was being reminded of how many little tweaks you make to an environment before it becomes your own environment. And they're things that you don't even think of until you go to get something working and, it, and it's not working. So there's probably quite an extensive list of things that maybe I even did subconsciously that, uh, yeah, that, you know, that make things work the way that I, you know, that I want them to work. But some of the things here is like, I didn't go through and configure autopilot or anything along those lines because it's not what I want this environment for. I just want this environment to be, you know, I want, if I'm, uh, you know, if I'm doing an AAD join of a new VM, I just want it to go through, enroll into Defender for Endpoint, so I start getting, you know, getting some signal from it. And then uh, the, you know, and then going, and the other recommendation I make here is, and I guess this one is primarily if it's a, like if you haven't used Defender for Cloud slash Azure Defender slash Azure Security Center standard previously. So if you haven't used that 30 day free trial period, uh, go through and enable that just so that you've got other, you know, some additional data sources coming through. So it's almost like if you're using, if you, so if you've got the ability for, like, for, for whatever reason, you've got the ability to go through and continually create new 30 day Azure subscriptions of some type, um, even if you're just doing it as pay as you go, then you can go through and get, like, even if you're not doing a free subscription, you get a ton of stuff for free during that first 30 days. So, um, so that's just a way that you can keep, keep costs down. Now, once you start moving into, like, what if you're new to Azure and, you know, so let's say you've never worked with Sentinel and you're not familiar with Azure. Um, do you need to know a lot about Azure to use Sentinel? Not really, but um, there's, like, so there, I guess there are some important things that, over time you will need to learn. But I guess what you need to think about overall is like, what's the goal? What are you trying to achieve? Are you trying to learn Azure functionality or are you trying to use Sentinel functionality? And keep that in mind as you're going through because 
Um, what you'll find is someone who's like, so like any of you who've got your own uh, like Azure environments, like you've probably gone through, you've got a whole bunch of different configuration settings that you probably try to replicate even if you're just setting up a 30-day tenant, there might be certain things you might just go through and do by default. So things that you know that you'll always see recommendations about is like things like using least privilege for the roles that you're using to perform certain tasks. Now, um, if you're if you're getting used to Azure, and the chances are, if you're going through going through and following a lot of the Azure Sentinel scenarios that you might find out there, what you'll probably find is that a lot of them have got you signing in with you know, yeah, they're not necessarily getting you to sign in and out with the appropriate roles to perform certain tasks. Instead, you're going in potentially with subscription owner, which means you know, subscription owner may be adding security reader, and then you can, you've basically got, oh, sorry, security operator, and you've got way more permission than you really need to get these tasks done. But for the, if you're just trying to learn Sentinel initially, I don't really think there's too much harm in that. Uh, in a production environment, obviously, obviously that's a terrible idea. Now, the other thing you need to think about is like just, you know, those of you who have got Azure subscriptions have probably all accidentally used something and left it floating around for longer than you should have and been a bit surprised by it at some point. So whether it was a VM that was running, whether it was a, a, a storage account you forget about. So make sure that you sort of start getting a grasp of, you know, what, you know, what are things that are going to cost you money versus not. So a good example of this one is like, People will say, make sure you, if you if you don't want your VMs to cost you money, deallocate, you know, make sure you're deallocating the virtual machines and having auto shutdown, et cetera, set on them. Great starting advice. But the thing to remember is even when that virtual machine is turned off, even if you're not accruing uh, compute costs, you're still going to be accruing disk charges. And if you're using premium disk, those charges are quickly going to become uh, you know, a pretty significant portion of, you know, of, of what your bill is. So even if we just jump out and I'll jump back to this, actually not that subscription. Let me close that one. I don't need that one any longer. That'll just save a bit of confusion. If I just jump in here and we take a look at usage. Now, because I'm using an Azure Pass for this one, that means that I can't actually use just the normal Azure cost management. I've got to jump out to this other portal that doesn't quite give me all the detail that I want, but gives you gives enough information to tell the story. So if we just sort of take a look here, so it's the cost here isn't 1221. The cost is actually um, $35. It's just because of I went through and renamed it and kind of split it out. But you see basically it's 36, so $37 total. If you take a look at where the vast majority of that $37 is coming from, there's so 19 and 15, there's $35 for virtual machine, virtual machine storage, and the virtual network, the public IP address. So effectively underneath that, you'll see that 57 cents for log analytics, uh, and some of that will get removed because it's for that computes, uh, it's for the upgrade analytics solution, 19 cents for logic apps, and that cost is actually quite high, and you'll see some of this stuff. I'll show you why that cost is quite high. I've, I basically, I had, Logic apps being triggered incredibly aggressively uh, as uh, as as run books for Sentinel. I'll, I'll explain to you why. So that you you really shouldn't see it shoot up um, like that. And then just for general storage and for you know some some data out. So realistically, there you can see that you know this has been running for like a couple of weeks and it's at like all up. If we ignore the compute costs that I wouldn't need to have as part of this, I've got a dollar. You know, under actually under under a dollar in there, so you can keep yeah, so you can keep things are uh, pretty yeah pretty cheap in there. Now other things, just like if you are new to Azure, keep things in the same region. I generally stick to Azure. Oh, sorry, to uh, what is it? East or US East? Uh, the reason is that generally for any kind of trial subscription, etc. Uh, that's the one that generally has the things you want available. And also it's a fairly low cost region as well. Now, having this stuff sitting over in the US versus having it, having it sitting in Australia East or Southeast isn't that big a deal because we're just looking, yeah, basically we're just collecting logs and uh, yeah, and that way if we are deploying things, they're gonna be a little bit cheaper over there. And because it's a test environment, we don't need to worry about governance and compliance, et cetera. So, uh, so basically it's, it's kind of a, a big win all around. 
Now, what if you're already, if you are already used to Sentinel, uh, or sorry, already used to as you're, and you're thinking, what are the things that yeah, are going to be important for you for Sentinel? Um, so, so this is where you jump in and start using things like least privilege. So learn what roles you actually need in Sentinel. So do you need to be, you know, uh, you know, do you need Sentinel reader, Sentinel contributor, et cetera? Uh, what, you know, do you need rights higher up? Do you need rights for, you know, to run logic apps, et cetera, or, you know, logic app creator? So, so at that point, you can start worrying about those things. Whereas if your goal is to learn more about Sentinel quickly, going down rabbit holes around Azure functionality and Azure permissions is it's a good distraction, but if you're trying to sort of cram a bunch of stuff into that 30-day window of free stuff, then it kind of, yeah, it kind of lights a fire under you to sort of stay a little bit focused. So if we take a look then at some of the things here, so new workspaces can ingest up to 10 gig a day of log data for the first 31 days. So that sounds really good for me. Um, so, and the other thing that's also important here is there's log analytics data ingestion as well as your Sentinel charges are going to be waived during that 31 trial period, 31 day trial. Um, so, yeah, so if we add Sentinel to an existing workspace, um, it will go through and waive the Sentinel charge for that first uh, first period. But generally, what I'd say is don't follow that second approach. That first approach, create a new workspace, which means that you get that 10 gig per day for that particular workspace. And then you get the Sentinel stuff for free on the top of that. Now, the so there are still going to be costs related. So here, where it's talking about automation, so if you're if you're triggering logic apps uh, uh, through your runbooks, if you're um, if you're going through and you know triggering uh, like here where they're talking about machine learning, if you're using Jupyter notebooks, they've got compute charges associated with them. So yeah, maybe not the things you wanted to jam in until you're kind of ready to. You know, to, to really start focusing on them. But this is another thing that's kind of nice though, is, is that you know this you can use this free trial option up to 20 times. Um, so, so that's yeah, so basically 20 times that is what you can do here. So that, that's kind of good. So even if someone says, look, I'm going to keep the same subscription, um, but what it means is you need to delete that Sentinel instance and you start again from scratch. But Probably not not the end of not the end of the world, and you'll have it down to a fine art if you try to do it. Yeah, you know, if you're doing it over a year and a half period, you will you'll be at the point where you should be automating the hell out of that stuff. And the other thing here is is that um, you know data can be ingested into the workspace at no charge for the first ninety days. You can start scaling data retention back to thirty days if you want to keep the environment running for longer. So that way you're not paying additional. So for the log analytics, it's kind of that's the underlying log analytics storage charge that. You know, if it's data that you're cycling through every 30 days anyway, there's no point trying to retain it for longer. So just like simple things that will you know, let you work, uh, you know, keep costs down. Now, just switching gears a little bit to the defender side. Um, so look, realistically, you're going to be using a Microsoft 365 E5 SKU that is either from the you know, either developer one or just a trial or you know, demos.microsoft.com if you've got access. So let's not worry too much about the other things. That's kind of the target of what you what you should be looking at. Now, for the initial M365 Defender setup, you know, just remember, and I'll just sort of quickly go through this one, uh, a, a few of these things for you, um, is, and because these are already enabled, I won't actually be able to go through and enable them because I wanted the stuff to be lighting up in here already. But if we just jump into... Um, I don't think I've got security.microsoft.com open yet. So let's just get that one opened up first. So all we're really doing here to begin with is we're just jumping into Microsoft 365 Defender. And, I, and if I hadn't enabled this already, there'd be an option here, like a button, enable Defender, it would be saying, here's where data is going to be stored, et cetera, and I'd agree to it and I'd be good to go. So that one's kind of a simple a simple start. Now, the second one for um, where we'd be going through and enabling the audit logs. Now, this is something that, if you, it, let me know if you know the answer to this one, because um, I haven't set up like a, a brand new production tenant in quite a while. Um, are audit logs enabled by default now, or do you still have to manually enable them? Do you, do you know? No, sorry, I don't. I haven't. Uh, yeah. 
haven't done yeah it's, for a while yeah so yeah and that's the thing it, it's it's one of those things where you always yeah previously you always had to do it but i've got a feeling though that either because i'm using tenants that have already got stuff in them or i'm getting using tenants that have had stuff deployed deliberately into them some of that stuff is already enabled but yeah but also so just make sure that auditing is enabled and because it's enabled i'm not getting an option to enable it it's it's just there and it's it's working now the other thing that is probably the final piece of this is just over in cloud app security um Hopefully, let's move, jump in. So just here under settings, security extensions, and then here under seam agent, you can see that I've already gone through and added in Sentinel. Um, but basically, yeah, it's just the wizard we walk through. We tell it uh, what it is. Um, and here, because I've already gone through and added Sentinel, it's basically forcing me down a different path because I've already got Sentinel connected. But that's, you know, all I'm really doing here is pointing it to the log analytics workspace that I've got Sentinel configured for. So it's a pretty quick process to go through. But you, you won't be able to perform this task until after you've got Sentinel. But that's kind of like one of the, the final Defender for M365 uh, setup components that you need to do. And that, yeah, again, yeah, most of these are like pretty quick steps. This one here, enabling Defender, that does take a couple of minutes because it's creating a workspace for you. Now, I've mentioned some of these things already, um, so we can go through them, you know, some of it fairly quickly. So if you are using, if you haven't already used, um, you know, whatever your Microsoft Defender for Cloud may have been pre used uh, called previously, enable it for 30 days. I just tend to turn it on by default for any new tenant I'm creating, uh, like if it's a 30 day tenant, because I just want that data, even if I'm not sure whether I'll need it or not. But the big one that we want in here is uh, if you, like if you do need to go through and start doing any testing with servers, uh, load up, yeah, enable Defender for servers. Now it's charged on a per minute basis, but um, it's only charging you for the minutes that the connected server is connected. So if that, so if you start a VM up and let it sort of just pump the data in once, and then you shut that server down, you're only paying for that initial period that it was connected. So it's so it's pro rata. So even though it's saying it's twenty dollars a month, uh, you can get it down obviously very significantly lower than that. And 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 as I mentioned, that would also go th if you've enabled Defender for Service and then deploy a Windows Server VM, that would also go through and create your Defender for Endpoint. Uh, it won't, create, it won't show you Defender for Endpoint licenses, but you'll have Defender for Endpoint available through uh, the Microsoft 365 Defender portal. Um, now, some of the things that I've, I've just sort of mentioned in here is, is that it's covered, it covers your Windows Server VMs and your the any that you're deploying in Azure, they'll automatically enroll if you've got it enabled, but it's not licensed for Windows 10 single users. So if you're using like, like multi-session, uh, it, then it is licensed. But yeah, just be careful here. It's I'm not saying okay, this is not a way to get Defender if you don't have a Defender license for clients. So so use that 30 or that 90 day trial option. Now the other thing that's um, finally uh, finally changed here, and this is something we discussed a few months back, was uh, Defender for Endpoint for Windows was included, but it was actually using a third party solution for Linux, whereas now it is actually using Defender for Endpoint for Linux in here, which is which is good news because it means you're getting the signals you want into Defender for Endpoint as uh, instead of it just ending up in Security Center. Now, there are other things you get with Defender for Servers, but for the focus here, it would really would just be for Defender for Endpoint. Now, the other things here is, you know, making sure that you've enabled, just, I just go through and enable it on all of them because for 30 days, it's free of charge. I don't, I don't care. Um, the subscription will be over in most cases for me. Uh, enabling auto provisioning of the different agents to make sure that there's there's less work you have to do to clean things up. Um, you know, uh, now, now with the uh, Defender for Cloud Apps and Defender for Endpoint, uh, these are enabled by default, but just make sure that they are enabled uh, so that you do start getting some of that integration. And you know, if you are going to keep that Azure sub subscription running for longer than that month period disable the workload protection so that you don't start you know, getting extra surprises in there. Now, just a few quick pieces here. I'll sort of just talk about a few things here and then 
we'll just go through a few things in the in the Sentinel, um, you know, if, through the Sentinel blades, is you know deploy a new log analytics workspace. So you know benefits there is that you get the uh, you know, you get the ten gig per day per month, um, and you know free basically free log and not or close enough to free log log analytics and Sentinel for that for that period. So that's so so they're good things. Um, in terms of resource groups, I normally just try to keep things separate. Now, if all this really is is for Sentinel, then you know just create like a Sentinel dash RG and just drop drop everything in it. There's probably no point going overboard the way you, you might have to normally. Um, and then, yeah, so to deploy the new log analytics workspace, then drop Sentinel into that uh, log analytics workspace. Now, what are the connectors? So rather than going through everything in here, um, I just want to point out a few things in here and then we'll, we'll jump into the portal and take a look. So with Azure AD, audit data isn't uh, isn't free. So that's built for ingestion into both Sentinel and Log, Log Analytics. So your Azure AD um, sign-in logs are, but the audit data isn't. Now with the M365 Defender, if it's not letting you turn that on, if it keeps giving you like error, like an error message when you're trying to activate it, it might just mean that you haven't given enough time for yeah, for that uh, provisioning of Defender or, or enabling Defender in the M365 Defender portal. So that's probably just you know wait a few more few more minutes or just verify that you actually did that uh, did that step. Now right now Defender the M365 Defender connector has got Defender for Endpoint in it and Defender for O365, which means that this Defender uh, for Identity isn't in there yet and Defender for Cloud Apps isn't in there yet. So you can do, still do all of them standalone, but um, so if someone says, look, I don't want to use preview versions, then it's like, okay, well, you, you don't use this one. Use um, Defender for Endpoint, which isn't preview, but Defender for 0365 is still preview. Now, just a few pages that I want to just, I'll drop them into chat so we, you can sort of look at them um, when you get a chance. But if we just jump in, let me just find them, it's, I need to, okay, I've got the docs article. I'll, I'll bring it up for you. Actually, I'll drop it into chat as well before I bring it up. Now, this is a really good page and it's probably the clearest page that I've seen in terms of what you do versus what you don't get charged for because you'll see some generic messaging that turns out not to be quite true. So I'm just scrolling in enough trying to get this to disappear from the left-hand side. So here we go. So, so even here, now see this conflicts with that other information I've got. So I've got to go through and check because I think I got that other information from this page. Um, this will teach me to mix and match information from different pages at Microsoft. <laughs> Let's go down to frequently asked questions. Um, what can be ingested at no cost? I know this one, this one is also saying Azure, Act oh sorry, that's Azure Activity Log, sorry. Sorry, you, that's my mistake there. Okay, yeah, so Azure Activity Logs come in free of charge, but it's your Azure AD. Actually, this one doesn't seem to be. Okay, so it's saying Azure AD. So you, there's kind of conflicting information in different places, but, but here we go, but let's just sort of use this. So. Uh, Azure Activity is free. Security alerts through identity protection is free. Um, now, the some of the so these you can see Office Activity across SharePoint, Exchange, and Teams. You can pick each of those connectors separately. Azure Defender alerts. Now, let's get into M365 Defender. So this is where you might accidentally end up, you know, thinking things are free. So security incidents and security alerts are free. But as soon as you start looking at just generic device information or events, then notice that all of these are going to be paid. Um, so does that mean you shouldn't use them? No, look, if it's like, unless you're sort of loading in hundreds of clients, um, which in a test environment, you're probably not, it's, it's gonna be sent. So I wouldn't worry about it too much. Now for Defender for Endpoint, so again, security alerts, you'll see they all come in as free. But on, I mentioned on, on the MCAS side, so back on that slide where we were talk, spoke about this now lights up for uh, for Mac clients. Um, 
notice that that one, because it's not a security feature, it's just more of an informational service. That is something that comes in, but it is paid. So this is where you, you, I wanted to just highlight this one quickly because it shows you that you can get quite granular about what it is that you, you know, that you do bring in versus what you, what you don't bring in. Now, I'll just quickly go through a few things on this slide, and then from here, we'll just sort of jump out to, to the tenant. So this is the last, there's one more slide, but it's just generic stuff um, that we can wrap up with at the end. But here in terms of like additional connectors, if as soon as you start pulling in, um, you, know, you, you know, if you wanna go through and just like simulate environments where you're not using uh, Defender for endpoints. So if you wanted to bring in security events via the, uh, like the, the traditional Microsoft monitoring agent or the Azure monitor agent, uh, you could go through and do that. Uh, you've got the, the new agent supports Windows and Linux. Um, you've got the, yeah, so basically this legacy connector, I, I don't know anyone who has started switching away from that legacy connector to the new AMA agent, uh, considering that it doesn't have to happen for another two and a half years. Um, like I, I, I don't think too many people be rushing, maybe just deploying it for new workloads. Now the other couple of things in here is as soon as you're getting into, like if you're doing anything with Linux, like if you're comfortable with Linux, like there's the there's an OMS agent, uh, there's the Ceph collector, but my recommendation would be if you're trying to cram stuff into that 30 day windows and Linux is not your skill set, you probably don't want to be firing up Linux VMs and trying to troubleshoot what dependencies are missing as to why you can't get certain agents or collectors installed. Um, so yeah, so yeah, so just sort of yeah, just to sort of keep things things like that in mind. And if you and again, if you want to sort of check for security things around EDR that aren't uh, Defender for Endpoint, there are third party solutions in there. But remember that they would need to connect to your appropriate to the data sources that you may not have the ability to pull that production inv information into into the test environment. So let's just quickly take a look at a few of those connectors. Um, so I've got 16 connectors connected. Um, you can see that, that for this one, I've actually gone onto the effort of actually setting up Linux VMs to show you. Like, so here's the connector page in here. And uh, so basically, like this, you know, if we're using sudo, uh, we've got, uh, basically we've got uh, Python scripts that we're using to go through and uh, pull down the, uh, the basically the uh, the data connector. So that's one place where we can go through and see that. Uh, now the, so you can see here that I've basically just set it up to pull something in, but I haven't connected anything else through to it. Now let me find another example. Let me just, but let me choose something that's more Windows related. Let me choose, I'll just sort of start off with the M365 Defender one. So you can see that what basically here, just watch the wording. They're telling you what M365 Defender suite includes but notice that they're not saying that this is what this connector currently does. Because if we scroll down, what you'll see is that there's some O365 stuff and there's some Intune stuff, uh, but they're or device uh, alerts, but we're not actually getting the other, the other pieces in here. So if we just sort of scroll down, what you can see here is you see that we can basically pick and choose. So if I just want to pick the ones that are, you know, things that are going to be loaded in free of charge, I can just start picking and choosing the different information that I want to, to bring in. Um, and also you can see here that uh, basically the other defenders will start lighting up in here as opposed to us using the, the separate ones. So this is just sort of, you know, it gives you a nice view, shows you, you know, moving forward, this is really where you'd, you'd, want, to be, you'd want to be doing things. Um, now, just sort of notice here, Defender for Cloud and Defender for Cloud Apps. Um, I, I kind of, you can kind of predict you know, people who aren't used to the naming that something like this might be, you know, could be problematic for them. But if we just go to Defender for Cloud Apps, all I really want to show you in here is that we've got the alerts and then we've got the cloud discovery logs. So if I don't want the SaaS app discovery uh, pieces uh, to cost money, then that is, yeah, I could start, you know, blocking those. And what you can see over here in this test environment, it's actually discovery that's generating data as opposed to the, the security alerts. But I'm, I'm not fussed. I just wanted stuff to, to light up. Now, if we just go through and take a look in here and what the next steps are, just so we can talk about um, some of these pieces. So first of all, for the workbooks, because um, I'm, I'm keeping an eye on time, we're running a little bit over, but for the workbooks, 
like so basically do you want a workbook for you know, discovery logs so if i click on that one you can see I've got, it's got the green bar which means i've already got it in here so if i open that up we can start seeing yeah even though i'm not really doing much inside of those vms i'm basically uh, letting them update uh, i've installed office etc onto them if we just go through and take a look at what's in here i've only got sanctioned apps um, so if i had unsanctioned apps then they'd be showing up as well and let's just select everything. But all this is really telling me is, is, is that it's actually the data is coming through from Defender ATP, so Win10 endpoint users. So what that means moving forward, if we've got MCAS, uh, sorry, if we've got that data feeding in from Max into MCAS, then that means that we should see another checkbox option down here for, for Mac OS as well. But if we just go through and there should be data in here. I'm in the right tenant. Okay, I don't know what's going on here because I should be getting a see even here, you can see that it's telling me that I should be getting a lot of results here. So I don't know why it's not showing. Okay, something's going something's going wrong with with my log analytics as you can see here this is the second thing that's not reporting what it it should be even though you can see from the drop downs there should actually be some more data coming through let's just try that again oh okay hang on ah oh, sorry it's because I've dropped screen resolution because I've shrunk my screen down to a quarter of the size it normally is. We're not, sorry, that was that one was definitely human error. So if we actually take a look here, if you know MCAS and know the way that it scores different apps, uh, you can see here obviously things that start with Microsoft get a score of 10 out of 10. Um, why on earth am I getting Skype for business light up in here? I do not know. Um, but, but basically this is just sort of showing you the you know cloud app discovery uh, capabilities. So, you know, so this way, yeah, the way to think about this is I don't need to be granted permissions to anything in M in MCAS if my role is like if you know if my role is you know I'm in the yeah I'm in the security team I'm monitoring uh yeah I'm in the SOC but I'm not administering the underlying workloads this way I can get the reports of what I need without actually having to get access to those uh, those other so all those other services so yeah so just sort of showing you a few of the different things there. Now, if we just sort of jump back, oops, not that far. Um, what that was the M M365 data connector. Let me just go back to that one. So I just want to walk you through some of the other, like the other top line functionality in here, uh, just really quickly. So if we just jump into next steps. So I just showed you that we can go through, we can add those workbooks that will recommend work, workbook space based on the workloads. But as we open up each of those workbooks, it would it would actually be going through and telling us that you know, these are the uh, different things that you may need to to light up. Um, so if there's so if I choose this zero trust one, for example, um, noticing here it's saying that here are the required data types and it's saying that, look, it can't really do everything it needs because certain things are actually missing. So data that you're not actually bringing in. So it gives you a bit of a you know, bit of a helping hand to push you into the you know, into the right uh, direction. But then also here, the analytics template. So if we jump in and we start taking a look at the, actually, oops, let's just jump down here to analytics. Now let's just sort of finish up on analytics. These are basically the queries that, we, that we're that we going through and, and running. So in this case, you can see like these are the active rules. So I think, um, yeah, I've got quite, a, got quite a few in there. I'm just sort of adding adding a bunch in. 
But if I wanted to just pick a rule template, you can see which ones, um, like so things that I'm already using, it will tell you, tell me that I've got it in use. But if there's something else here, so if I say, like if we take a look at that Solario gate named pipe, for example, and I want to create a rule based on this, then here's the, the KQL that's, that's already there. And then I can just basically go through and say, what do I want to do from it? So if we just say, look, let's just stick to the, we'll follow the, we'll follow the bouncing ball. Um, do we want incidents to trigger alerts or do we want the, uh, the incident, sorry, the alerts to be grouped together into, yeah, so it's like, so let's, you know, say let's, we want to create incidents, but we actually want it to be, let's say, we don't want it when there's one. We want, we say that we want it to be, you know, the, this number, for example. So that way we're not getting, getting bombarded. And I'll show, I'll be able to show you what, what I mean by getting bombarded in just a moment. So then in terms of the automated response, this is where we're going through and choosing um, actually good, uh, basically in this case, it's saying trigger an alert and this will get pushed into a Teams channel as opposed to just sending it through email, for example. But yeah, just sort of showing you some of the things here. And with that Teams alert, I just want to focus on one last thing here, just to sort of show you, if you need to sort of create data, <laughs> there are a lot of different ways you can do it without too much trouble. So if I just go to the Office 365 connector, um, notice in here that I've got a ton of Teams activity. And the way that I triggered that was by using that, um, that um, logic app and basically saying, run it every five minutes and query the last day to see if that event has occurred. And so basically, or if that incident, um, that alert had occurred. So basically for a, a 24 hour window, I was triggering an alert every five minutes based on any, an alert that I already had notifications about. It was just a way of pumping a bunch of stuff into Teams. So that way you can see that there's a ton of Teams data going through here. So, so there are like a lot of different ways that you can do stuff like that. But this is also showing you why I mentioned that I deliberately was doing things with logic apps to trigger data. And that's why my logic app costs were really high. And by really high, what was it, 27 cents? If I hadn't have sort of run that hundreds of times here, it would be you know two you know two cents or one cent for example. So just to sort of show you know little things you can do that sometimes if you're sort of following some of the like you know the, like the different ninja training etc for Sentinel, some of the scenarios might sort of be just there trying to sort of create something high impact. But once you learn a bit more about Sentinel, you'll go. I just need to see it once. I don't need to see a hundred alerts based on the same same thing for example. But there's yeah, there's plenty of other stuff that you know we can sort of do like get, jump a bit further into things in in the future. But you know, there's obviously a lot that you can do in here. But just to sort of wrap up with the final guidance around you know how do you approach Sentinel is you know say you know if someone says I need to learn Sentinel like that's a great starting point. But it's like you need to be more specific. It's like okay, what is the workload that you know what workload do you already understand that Sentinel easily supports? And if we put the additional filter at low cost in here, then that's something that really means that you take your existing knowledge and that allows you to learn more about the way Sentinel works, as opposed to if you're trying to figure out how to use Sentinel and learn Linux dependencies and why sudo is not working, et cetera. That's, that's not teaching you about Sentinel. That's kind of just shooting you in a thousand different directions. Um, but for, for this one, obviously, I focused on the M365 connectors because that's what's really the appropriate thing for, you know, for what we generally talk about here. And, you know, basically, you know, there's no shortage of different, uh, like, tutorials uh, and samples you can work through here. So even if you're not finding anything specific on the Sentinel side for what it is you're trying to test in Defender for Endpoint or, you know, Defender for, for Identity or Defender for 0365, if if you go through the, def the Microsoft Defender scenarios, as long as you've got the connectors in place, that stuff is going to roll through to Sentinel anyway. So you don't need to think of look for Sentinel specific ways to trigger alerts, et cetera. Go through, you know, go through the underlying workload protection documentation and that will steer you in the, in the, right, in the right direction. But I, and I guess the other thing here is, is that, you know, so again, like even with things like connectors, if you're looking at a connector going, I, I've spent hours trying to figure out how to get this connected to work. If it's not a connector that you really need to know about right now, don't worry about it. Focus on workloads that you can get the connector going, they light up quickly and data starts showing up. Because the goal here is to, you know, isn't to sort of 
learn everything you can about what Sentinel does across all of these random workloads. Pick one or two smaller workloads, so maybe identity and device protection, as opposed to saying and VMs and as your VNets and as your load balances. There's like there's just yeah. You know, if you start sort of limiting the scope, it just makes it a lot easier. And I guarantee you'll find scenarios in some you know in some form that. You know that even if they're not specifically designed for Sentinel, as long as they're triggering the right kind of events and alerts, uh, Sentinel will start showing them up for you. So that's really the you know the stuff that I wanted to go through with you there. So hopefully that's something where you know some of that stuff might be useful for you. But I guess you know we can sort of I'll finish the the recording now just so that if like we can sort of keep the the Q and A fairly fairly open. But I guess just some of the things you know that you know. Yeah, let me actually let me just sort of stop the recording.